In the absence of facts, I believe it's human nature to substitute fears in place of truth. Like, when I was little, I completely believed that breaking an arm or a leg was simply part of growing up, and that it was only a matter of time before it was my turn, like losing a tooth or showing up to third grade. And although I've still never broken a bone, there, there were a couple of years where I lived in constant fear of one of my limbs spontaneously snapping Joe Theismann style. Well, the truth is, it seems that no matter how much we grow up and how much we accomplish, there are these stories we tend to tell ourselves that can keep us from being in the moment or achieving the very success we're going for. So I wanna talk about five lies I used to, and sometimes still do, tell myself about being a composer on this week's episode of the 52 Q's podcast. What is happening, everybody? This is Dave Croft, and welcome back to another episode of the 52 Q's podcast, a weekly podcast dedicated to all things production and library music, where we talk about industry topics and explore how you can grow your career as a production music composer. Plus, every week I give feedback on a Q written by a member of the 52 Q's community, and today we're going to take a listen to an action percussion Q written by longtime supporter Michael Reschke, so you definitely want to stick around for that. If this is your first time here, welcome, whether you're watching on YouTube or listening to the audio podcast on the go. I just want to thank you for spending part of your day with me. Uh, this episode is made possible by today's sponsor, you, the family, friends, and patrons of 52Qs who help keep the podcast, the channel, and everything running. We are 100% community supported, so you're not going to hear any sponsored segments for plugins or earbuds. But if you want to learn more about how you can help support 52Qs and also unlock community perks like live streams, workshops, Zoom feedback sessions, and a ton more, then be sure to click on the links in the description or stick around because we're going to be talking more about that a little bit later in today's episode. So I want to talk today about these stories, the lies that we tell ourselves. And for whatever reason, we believe, and they can be kind of hard to shake. And I find myself having to to, to say, okay, no, they, this isn't true. You, you, you don't really believe this. This isn't the thing that's getting in the way of your professional career. And these aren't in any particular order, and I would be surprised if at least one or two of these don't resonate with you. And if they don't, then I definitely want to hear, hear from you in the comments. Please let me know. And if they do, let me know in the comments as well. I, I would love to hear your strategies for overcoming some of these. And if I've missed any lies, please let me know in the comments. But again, these aren't in any particular order, but here, here's the first one. That next plugin, that next sample library, that's going to be the thing that really unlocks your creativity. That sale that you just got an email about, ooh, you, you need that plugin. There are so many cues you could be writing right now if only you had that new synth, that new string library. Ooh, you just got a brief for a, a percussion cue. Don't you need, don't you need that percussion library you've had your eye on? You know, real composers, you know, they, they, have, they have that $800 orchestra library. And if you did, then boy, boy, would you be so creative. Boy, you, it's just going to unlock a whole new level of output and creativity. The thing that's keeping you fr from really succeeding is you don't have enough sounds. Does this sound familiar? Boy, does this get me. And it seems to get me every year 
around Black Friday, when I start getting the emails, when I start getting the FOMO, the sale, as, as I'm recording this right now, Native Instruments is running like 50% off of everything. Spitfire just uh, just put like all their Albions on sale and I, I'm missing some. And I'm like, ooh, maybe, I don't have Albion 1. Maybe, maybe I really need that. And this isn't about the companies. This isn't about, you know, folks creating good sample sounds and libraries and plugins and selling them to you. I have BBCSO and I love it. So this not, not what this is about. This is about the story we tell ourselves that if only we had that new plugin, then we could be successful. And that is just not true. Because it's, it's not the gear. It's not, it's not the sounds that make the cue. It's the composer and what they do with that, with those sounds. And yes, there are libraries and patches that are amazing, that really can help you along. I'm not debating that. I mean, look at all of the love that, that I've, I've shown The Unfinished and Matt's patches for Omnisphere and Zebra, 100%. I can say... In, 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 in all honesty, that my understanding of Omnisphere very, very much deepened when I got into using those sounds. However, that's, I think that's different than saying, hey, if only I had these plugins, then I would be creative. As I'm thinking back on it, I was just so blown away by those plugins and they showed me what I could do with a plugin that I already had. I already had Omnisphere. I barely used it. But then seeing a real professional using it, I'm like, oh, oh, now I get it. So that's really how the unfinished and Matt Bowdler's Omnisphere patches helped me, helped me understand a tool I already had. And that's the point. The tools you already have can already do so much. It just takes a little bit of, of education, a little bit of confidence, a little bit of experience, some trial and error. You, you put away the credit card. And if you need to, to unsubscribe from those emails, do it. I have. As you're building your career, as you're building your sound library, be strategic. Find, you know, what, what's a very real gap in your plugins. And then be super like laser focused that this is going to do so many things for me. I think that's okay. That was me jumping onto the Symphobia bandwagon early on, like going on 10 years now. Yeah, longer than that. Yeah, about 10 years. Because I knew I needed to, to up my string and brass libraries. Especially 10 years ago, stock logic was even. <laughs> but that having been said, the stock sounds that come with whatever DAW you're using, especially if it's logic, especially if it's Ableton, Reason. Yeah, these, these DAWs come with a ton of stock sounds. Have you spent as much time with those as you have browsing sales? Again, I'm telling myself <laughs> as much as I'm telling you. <laughs> uh, yeah, these summer sales are killing me. I, I've, I've had to close, like actively close windows in the middle of shopping because I'm like, what are you doing? Just this week, I had another uh, project hit my desk. And uh, it, they, they were looking for vocal, like eerie vocal tension cues. And so I thought to myself, and I caught myself thinking, ooh, uh, isn't that the excuse I need to buy Heaviosity's Vocalese 3? I love Vocalese. I love Heaviosity. I love what they do. 
but do I need that? Do I need to drop that 80 bucks or whatever to use here? Or have, have I, if I'm being honest with myself, have I really explored the plugins and samples and sounds I already have? I'm, I'm sitting on 6,000 splice credits. What would happen if I take a, a splice vocal sample and bring it into a plugin I already have, Omnisphere, or bring it into the sampler and mangle it and create my own eerie vocal pad? Well, that, that's what I ended up doing after I went through my, uh, <laughs> Shannon and I call it shark eyes, like, you know, in Finding Nemo, when Bruce smells blood in the water and he goes, you know, gets big shark eyes and like, ah, uh, you know, fish are no longer friends, they're food. Yeah, I, I totally get that. I get it every, like I said, every, uh, every major holiday in the U.S. seems to come with a, a batch of sales. And Black Friday, it's, it's like, oh my gosh. Yep. Yeah, we all, I almost need like a, a 12 step program to help us get through that entire season. If like me, you know, you have an addiction to buying these things. Yeah. Then, you know, I'm being a little tongue in cheek here, but I, uh, there's, I think there's some truth to that. There's, there's some, there's some, yeah. So the lie that the next plugin, the next piece of uh, gear, the next, you know, sample library, that's going to be the thing that really unlocks your creativity, that there's a whole level of, of, of output, of productivity that you're just waiting to achieve once you get that next plugin. That's a lie. It's just not true. So be honest with yourself. Be happy with what you have. Learn those. And only after you've spent time with what you have, can you really and soberly see what you need. So that's the first lie that I used to and to be honest, I even just this last week, I, I believe this. <laughs> All right. And related to that, the second lie, that you have to have the perfect studio environment to be a real professional. That you have to have the perfect speakers. You have to have the perfect room treatment you have to have done the perfect mathematical freaking beautiful mind calculations in measuring reflections, having diffusers, having flow. Now, all those things matter. They're important. Don't misunderstand me. I am not belittling having good speakers. I'm not belittling tuning your room. Sound. I mean, I have sound treatments in my studio here. But the lie is, is that you have to do that in order to make music, to have a career. I think it's something worth working towards, but it's not standing in your way. It's not keeping you from succeeding. Whether it's speakers, room treatment, or the perfect MIDI controller. And you see how this is kind of related to the, to the, the plugins with plugins. That's about, you know, that next piece of gear is going to, it's going to allow me to succeed and position me to succeed. This has to do with not feeling like your space is professional enough. We have a thread over at the 52 Qs and it's like, show us your studio space. And some of these spaces are amazing. I mean, for me, they're like, woo, adulting goals. <laughs> but the one that sticks with me the most is a picture of a laptop, headphones, and a little 25 key mini key keyboard. Yep. Because the truth is, if you know your sounds, you know your gear, you can make money 
on a laptop and headphones and a dinky 25 key mini keyboard. Yes. Do all these things help? Absolutely. Are they required? Is the lack of a floating fo a floor and diffusing room treatments, is that keeping you from your success? No. It's not standing in the way of your ability to make music. And that's the lie. Work towards it. Find the things that can help. Realize that you don't have to wait until you get to some certain imaginary threshold and then you can start your professional output. No, if you do that, if you, if you wait until you have the perfect studio, you'll never get started. You'll never get started. I, I, I would go out on a limb and say that every professional composer started probably in some room in their house with laughably inconsistent acoustics. <laughs> I, I would go out on a limb and say that. Not many composers started their career plopped down in the middle of a perfectly treated room or with all the best gear. Nope. And to be honest, if I had the money, like where I'm at right now, if I had the money to spend on like $6,000 in studio monitors, is that the best use of my six grand? Probably not. Probably get a new computer or I don't know, room treatment. I mean, there's, there are lots of different ways you could spend that kind of money rather than the studio speakers. I mean, my studio speakers, they're like five inch JBLs. I've talked before, I do most of my mixing on these. Yep. Headphones. $100 Sonys. I haven't even sprung for the expensive headphones. I know those headphones. I've used them for years. I know their bias. I know what they sound like. I know the, the, the frequencies they, they mistakenly exaggerate, but I like the way they sound. They're comfortable. They'll, they're built like a tank. They got a nice long cable. Anyways, this isn't, this isn't about the headphones, but the gear I know, the studio space I know will always be better than the studio gear I wish I had. Because that's that perfect studio space isn't standing in your way. So if you're in a bedroom right now, if you are in a room over garage, that's what this is. If you're in, you know, a, a spare room in the house, if you've got a laptop on a breakfast room table and headphones, you can make a living at this. You can. So you don't have to have the perfect studio space with the, the best room treatment and the best monitors or the most expensive, best computer. Nope. So that's the second lie. The third lie that I used to believe and still catch myself believing is that I must be highly educated. That I must be highly educated in order to, to really be a professional at this. I used to believe that I was somehow missing out on career opportunities because like I didn't have a doctorate. I have a friend of mine who has his doctorate, teaches up at Berkeley. He's great. Dude is a machine. But we both write for the same publisher. And I had that epiphanal moment of, oh my gosh, we've taken separate career paths. He went like film scoring, traditional kind of doctorate in film music. I went like jazz, studio drumming. <laughs> and yet here we are converged in the same career path. And I have talked about that on, on the podcast before about 
how there are different paths to becoming a production music composer. This is why I talk, anytime I do an interview, I always ask folks, you know, how, how did you get to, to where you are? Because I think it's important to underline that there are so many different ways to become a professional at this. One of the ways I used to believe was you had to get highly educated. You had to have a doctorate. And I still catch myself battling this, even though I know, I know. A doctorate isn't going to, for me, isn't going to unlock anything. Is it vanity? Is it credentials? Is it wanting somebody to call me doc? Maybe a little. That's because one of my composition teachers uh, in college Dr. Scott Meister, I don't know if he watches, uh, he, he called Doc, and I love that. And, and I fell in love with the idea of people calling me Doc. Not for the record, don't anybody call me Doc. I, just, I don't have a doctorate, don't call me Doc. But uh, I, I will allow Professor, you know, because I am I'm a professor, but uh, if you want to call me Professor, that's fine. But uh, there's a part of me that wants to be called Doc. Mm. But do I have to have that? No. And, and let's even back up away from like terminal degrees. If you're sitting here right now listening to this, you might be thinking, oh my gosh, I don't even have a bachelor's. What are you talking doctorates? Well, that's also true. Did you know that you don't have to have studied Rimsky-Korsakoff's orchestration book in order to be a quote unquote real composer? Did you know that? Did you know that you don't have to know the modes? You don't have to know the difference between 12-8 and 9-8. Like on paper, the music theory side of things. Now, you might be listening to this and going, oh my gosh, Dave, they, they, you're cra this is crazy talk. This is heresy. But just because you might not necessarily be able to write 9-8 on a staff doesn't mean that you don't feel it, that you don't internalize. And this is something that I would argue with anybody who tries to say how, you know, like Danny Elfman doesn't read music. Dum bum bum. That B.B. Uh, King can't play chords. Bum bum bum. Liberty DeVito, the drummer for Billy Joel, can't read music. Bum, bum, bum. Well, that supposes that reading music equals knowing music, and that is not true. Because I guarantee you that Danny Elfman knows music. People have, have, have said Hans Zimmer doesn't know how to read music. Well, Hans Zimmer understands music. Right. Hans Zimmer understands music in, in the same way that like, like can Ray Charles, could, could he read music? Well, no. <laughs> Ray Charles was blind and never read a sheet of music in his life. Did he know music? Absolutely. Does that make sense? There are many different ways to know and understand music beyond just music theory. And I think in academia, I think, I think we hang a little bit too much on music theory. Music theory isn't a set of, set of rules that we have to obey. It's a, just a set of, it's, it's a way to understand musical principles that are already in place. And some people understand conceptually musical ideas and musical concepts without needing to know or without ever having learned the theory that goes behind it. Like, you don't have to know how gravity works to, to shoot a basketball. Even though there are a ton of physics involved in shooting a three-pointer. Do you think Steph Curry is like doing the, the calculations? No. Nope. Like, I mean, meaning the math. I think he feels it. Some of the best players 
I've ever heard in my life doing some of the most complex, advanced, like jazz harmonies. Wouldn't be able to, to, to read sheet music if you put it in front of them. And that's okay. That's completely okay. Can reading music help? Absolutely. Just like having a perfectly treated acoustic room can help. I'm not saying that learning theory is bad, just like I'm not saying get $6,000 of speakers is bad. Nope. The lie is that I have to have a deep theoretical understanding. And until I do, that it's keeping me from succeeding. And that, that's the lie. The lie that I have to have a PhD in order to be, you know, a success in whatever that means in academia. Feeling me? You don't have to have this deep education in order to start succeeding in music. So that's lie number three that I've caught myself just even recently telling myself. Uh, I should change the title. It should be lies I just keep freaking telling myself. All right, lie number four. When my cues are perfect, then I'll submit them. When my cues sound absolutely perfect and when they're completely finished and they're only finished when they're perfect, then, then I can submit them. Friends, if, if you are waiting to, to feel like the cue is absolutely, I couldn't change a single thing perfect, then I'm afraid you will be waiting a long time. At least that's my experience. See, see cues are never finished. They're just due. <laughs> cues are never finished. They're just due, right? Deadlines. Because there's always something to improve because we're already always looking to improve ourselves as composers and producers. And so if we wait until the cue is absolutely perfect, then you will keep waiting. And man, perfectionism can be such a motivation killer. It can be such a productivity killer. It can be, it can just really just drain your desire to do this if you are striving for absolute perfection. And I, and I know, you know, I have a perfection streak in me. And, and uh, I mean, Shannon has shared this. I mean, Shannon, my wife, Shannon, Mrs. 52 Qs, who you'll hear later. Yeah, she'll tell you she has a strong perfectionism streak. And it usually comes from very intelligent people. Shannon is very, very smart. And it's in that intelligence that you find all the little things that you can improve. All the things you would change. I'm writing a cue. I'm like, oh, I listen to it in the car. And I'm like, oh, that... That velocity, it just happened again. <laughs> Lies, I'm still telling myself. This happened just this week. The, the queue was already submitted. Like I had already shipped it off, already done my deliverables. The library has it. The library's happy. Publisher's good to go. But even yesterday, I'm listening to it in the car. I'm like, ah, hmm. that velocity in bar three isn't right. <laughs> And it really kind of robbed me of, of the joy of the moment of feeling like it's done. There, there will always be something to improve in your, in your workflow, in your, in your projects, in your, the, everything that you're writing. There will always be room for improvement. So I'm not saying don't try to get better. I think it's, I think it's worth trying to be perfect just as long as we know we're never going to be perfect. There will always be something you could improve on whatever cue. And, and that's, that's not necessarily the lie. The lie is I will only submit them when they're perfect. And it's not until they're perfect that I feel that I can 
submit them. That's the lie. Again, not to say there isn't something that you should work on and improving and, and we're striving for that. But if in your quest for perfectionism, if it's keeping you from taking your shot, from, from sending music along to your publishers or taxi briefs or whatever, and you're not doing it because uh, it's not perfect, that's the lie. Because it's on, that's, that's the only way you improve is by taking your shot, doing the work, doing the reps, the re repetition, which means some flaws are going to get through. But if you wait until your cues are perfect until you submit, then you're probably sitting on a hard drive of really good cues, but no placements. So you don't have to wait until they're perfect. And then finally, the fifth lie. Everyone else has it all figured out. Everyone I talk to in the community, even this guy looking at me, you know, on YouTube, he's got it all figured out. He's so far ahead of where I want to be. He's, he's clearly, I mean, look at that studio. I mean, dude has like lights. Look at the, the, the camera. It's like the soft bokeh effect. Clearly. I mean, He's got to know what he's talking about. He's, he's on YouTube. He's on a podcast. He has a community. He's been teaching for 25 years. Look at his credits. A dude clearly has it all figured out. And everyone else has it all figured out except for me. Man. Whew. When they find out that I don't, they're going to know I'm, I'm a hack. Does anybody want to take a guess at what, what the other word for this is? Yep. Imposter syndrome. This happens to me. I'm watching YouTube because I, I consume about as much YouTube as I make. And I'm seeing, like, and I'm watching them. I'm like, man. That guy, that's that's who I want to be. He clearly has it all figured out. Look, look, look at look at that. Oh man, these videos are so good. His music is so good. And look, there's like a piano behind him. And man, I bet he's got it all figured out. Oh, look at her. She's she lives in L.A. She's scoring movies. And man, I bet she's got it all figured out. Or, wow, he lives in Boston, teaches at Berkeley, got a beautiful family. Oh, his Instagram posts so many, so many amazing. Well, his kids are eating pancakes every day. Man, he's got it all figured out. By the way, these are all autobiographical. These are very real thoughts that I've had. And, ah. Uh, we don't. If you're looking at me right now and you're like, ooh, I bet that guy has it all figured out. Man, I'm here to tell you, I don't. I may be further along, but we're just on the same path. And I'm figuring it out as I go, just like you are. Trying to surround myself with people who have gone through things who can help, but... We are all, we are all making this up as we go. We're all taking in information and then best guessing it. Is that too real? Is that too much inside baseball? And I, 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 I bet I could call those folks that I referenced in, in the, earlier the LA composer or the Boston teacher or the other YouTuber from Texas. And I can, I could probably, they, I imagine they would agree with me. Now, that doesn't mean they're stupid. That doesn't mean they know nothing. 
I mean, obviously, they know something, they've achieved success, but the idea that they've got it all figured out, that is the lie. Because that the imposter syndrome of, of seeing somebody succeed and being unable or unable, rather, to recognize the success in yourself and that it's only a matter of time before everybody figures it out and my house of cards comes tumbling down, that's mm, that's where I've felt imposter syndrome kind of settle in for me and I'm imagining for many of you. So instead of when you see the folks that you admire professionally or personally, instead of like thinking, hmm, they've got it all figured out, just say, It's just a dude, <laughs> right? Just, just, a, just a gal who is on the same path I am, probably dealing with some of the same insecurities, having made some of the same mistakes, making mistakes that I have yet to make. But at the end of the day, they're doing the best they can, making the best guesses they can in an industry that is always changing. And don't mistake lack of overt, uh, how do I want to say this? Don't mistake the, la the lack of outward-facing insecurity to be mistaken for complete confidence. <laughs> I hope that's okay to say. Just trying to peel back the curtain a little bit for you here. But we don't all have it figured out. We don't all have it figured out. We're doing the best we can. The lie is believing that until you have it figured out, you will not succeed. That's the lie. That's only when you get everything sorted and you feel like you've got it all worked out, then you'll be able to be a professional composer. That's the lie. Do you, do you hear a, 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 a running thread through all of these things? How there is something keeping you from succeeding. Like the plugins. If you don't have the plugins, then you can't succeed. The perfect studio. In, in, until you have the perfect studio, you're not going to succeed. Or until you know music theory or until you have that degree, then you're not going to succeed. Until your cues are perfect, you won't succeed. Or until you've got it all figured out, you won't succeed. The ultimate lie in all of these is that there is something keeping you from being the best version of yourself. And really, the only thing standing in your way are these stories. So push through them. Acknowledge them. Acknowledge that, hey, I see that thing right there. That's not true. Hi there. You're, you're not true, so I'm going to need you to step off. <laughs> and then with courage and confidence, go forward. So those are the five lies that I have told and keep telling myself, but I would love to hear from you. Do you have lies that you have found yourself believing? Please let me know in the comments below. I do read all of those and would absolutely love to hear from you. So we're going to take a quick break and we're going to hear from Mrs. 52 Qs, who's going to tell us all about how you can join the community. But when we return, we're going to be listening to an action percussion cue from longtime community member and friend of 52 Qs, Michael Reschke. Hey y'all, I'm Shannon Croft, and I want to tell you that the 52 Cues podcast is made possible by viewers and listeners just like you, composers and producers who are looking for a better way to connect and collaborate. You see, 52 Cues isn't just another website selling static, pre-recorded videos to a mass audience. It's a fun, vibrant, and positive community that comes together online for sharing cues, getting feedback, and discussing what's up in the production music industry. 
You'll find both personalized feedback and live interaction, which are the best and fastest ways to grow your skills and earn more placements. The best part is that the 52Qs community is absolutely free. And when you're ready to take your career to the next level, we offer friends and family subscriptions, which unlock weekly live streams, live interactive group feedback sessions, monthly interactive workshops, and more. Head over to 52Qs.com and sign up today. And while you're there, check out our personalized feedback videos, private lessons, and of course, merch. I can't wait to see you at 52Qs.com. So that was Under Attack by Michael Reschke. Michael, thank you so much for sending this along. This was sent along during our week 25 weekly feedback threads. We put weekly feedback threads together every single week and folks add their cues and I choose one of those to talk about. So this is Under Attack. And um, Michael is a uh, is a longtime supporter of 52 Cues and is a a bona fide real deal like drum instructor and uh yeah i i always, always love seeing his space because he's he's it's like it's like goals he he is the drummer that i wanted to be so bad when i was growing up you know all the drum set stuff like it's like john bonham meets neil peart meet terry meets terry bozio and uh yeah he he is he is what like a, a a drum instructor should should be, and it was when I I knew that I didn't have that in me that I had to kind of step away from teaching drums myself, because there's there's a level of passion that that Michael has for drumming and being a drum instructor and for for teaching students and teaching kids and everything, and so just a tip of the hat to you, sir. Uh, I love. Yeah, the shots, the background, it's really, really good. So, uh, and so it's no doubt at all why this sounds so good and all the percussion work is really, really top notch. Um, I do have to say that uh, I thought overall the mix came across a little quiet. And I know that this was for a, a library that, that you got some traction with. And so this is a whole album. This might be their specs. But, you know, we're coming in around minus 13, minus 14 luffs or so. And so it felt a little quiet to me. Uh, and I wasn't quite sure about this intro thing. Wasn't quite sure about that. I think we could have started with this spot right here. Yeah, I think we could have started with that, but again, this might be something that they're that they're asking for, that the library is asking for. If that's the case, can we make this downbeat a lot more pronounced at the intro? Because it doesn't really hit. Right, it, it doesn't really hit kind of as strong as it should. And if we're looking at the waveform here, we can kind of see how, 
how it almost pulls back a little bit before we get to the impact. And I wonder if we should drive, wham, you know, right into it. And so I'm, I'm gonna actually, I'm gonna see, I'm gonna trim this up and see what that would sound like. I'm just kind of faking an edit here to see if that will, will help. This might not sound good. And then I would trim, I would trim off, uh, let, let that intro come in, uh, let, let the, the beginning part come in a little bit faster here. So the, the opening is more like this. Yeah, kind of, kind of, kind of get on with it, right? Because this, this is, this is the real meat of the cue. Good layering. Yeah, probably could have done a little bit more of a of a of a riser or something here. Yeah, and, and here the, the timing of, of this riser, is, I, I feel like the momentum just really kind of bottomed out. Again, this is all assuming that this isn't specifically what the library was looking for, which is entirely possible. It's just the momentum kind of kind of dropped out. So just like with the intro, kind of getting on with it a little bit earlier, I love the new hybrid elements that we're bringing in here. Lo love this. Feel like there needed to be a little bit of a of an increase in energy. I'm not not really hearing the the energy level build in this next section. Uh, I can see it. I can see it in the waveform, but I don't really feel it. And the phrasing there felt a little too. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight. All right, so we're in eight bar chunks. One, two, three, four. All right, so so we had this is a large twelve bar chunks, and and I don't know I don't know if it's oops, from here to here. Uh, I don't know if it's just my uh, my internal phrase clock. I'm feeling one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I'm miscounting there, but um, but yeah, it felt a little a little weird to go to kind of pull the energy back at this point. Yeah, I would almost keep. that energy cooking hear how it, it it feels like it's gearing down and we could probably put a little bit more riser energy into that sub drop uh, and using that the same this that same energy then hit that downbeat Nice stereo width and stereo spread here. But nice job, really nice job. And uh, again, I expected nothing less uh, because your percussion work is so well done and I do appreciate you sending this along. Uh, as I mentioned, this was sent along during our week 25 feedback thread. Uh, we put feedback threads together every single week and right now we are collecting cues here in week 26. We are halfway through the year and so I'm gonna be choosing one of these cues to talk about on next week's 
episode. Uh, and if you found that feedback helpful and you would like feedback for your own cues, then why don't you head over to 52cues.com slash coaching and you can order up your own feedback video, 15 minute feedback video, where I do a complete breakdown of your cue, the form, structure, uh, melodic considerations, harmonic considerations, mix, title, everything. Uh, head over again to 52cues.com slash coaching and you can order that. And while you're there, you can also check out my one-on-one -on -one coaching sessions and sign up for the mailing list to, to, uh, to see when the winter 2024 mastermind opens up because the spring the summer 2023 mastermind is full so uh, registration is closed for that looking forward to starting that just next week but that's going to do it for me uh, once again thank you so much to the family friends and patrons of 52 cues who help keep all of this going if you're interested why don't you head over to 52 cues.com and sign up today if you want to join the community you can do that it's free you don't have to be a patron or anything but if you want to help pay it forward and help keep you know podcast and everything cooking then uh, you can support us by uh, subscribing to one of our subscription tiers but that's going to do it you definitely want to tune in next week where i welcome special guest youtuber composer hip-hop jedi master anthony clint jr i welcome him to the show we talk everything about writing for sports to beard care and hip-hop so you definitely want to tune in for that but that's going to do it for me this week i hope that you've had an amazing week 25 and i know and believe that your week 26 is going great why do i know that friends because i know and trust that the universe has amazing plans just for you until next time peace the 52 Cues podcast is copyright 2023 at 18 Studios, all rights reserved. The music played on the podcast is copyright of their respective owners and is used with permission and for educational purposes only. For more information, including joining the community and submitting your cue for consideration on the podcast, head over to 52Qs.com.